I think 900 people at the event today. Uh, please use that chat function to ask any questions uh, and that's open, I think, uh, as soon as the lecture starts. Uh, and as I say, you can also email those across to uh, Manchester. And if we can have the next slide, please. I think I've dealt with this already, but uh, you can see the programme there, so I won't dwell any longer on that. But what I will do next is pass over to Neil, who will just give you a few words of introduction on the Thomas Ashton Institute. Thank you, Neil. Thank you so much, Andrew, and welcome all of you to uh, this inaugural Thomas Ashton Lecture. Uh, my name is Neil Bourne, and I direct the Institute from the University of Manchester side. Uh, Thomas Ashton was born in 1818, and we founded an institute 200 years after the date of his birth. Um, so we've been around now for uh, almost three years. Um, and Thomas Ashton was one of the first workers champions for social responsibility. And that's one of our key visions for the institute. It's particularly um, fortunate that today, the UOM has been voted the world's best for its action on social responsibility and sustainable development. Uh, so our partnership uh, between the University of Manchester and the HSC um, has really given a boost to uh, those efforts within the university that have led to that award. We are trying as an institute to gather the evidence to underpin a safer working world. We do that through six themes, and those are listed on the slide that you can see in front of you there. We work, though, between those themes in a collective team, uh, and that shows the very close links that exist between the HSC Science Division and the University of Manchester across all of the faculty. So at a, a time of unique global stress, uh, we're about to hopefully come out of a pandemic to a new world of work. What's it going to look like? And how will it be regulated? Uh, and uh, as Andrew said, we're very privileged to have one of the leading thinkers on regulating the workplace, giving our first lecture. David worked with HSE for 35 years and rose to chief executive. Um, indeed, he got the order of the Bath in the Queen's Birthday Honours in 2020. So we're very privileged to welcome David to give the lecture. Um, and uh, over to you, David, please. Thanks, Neil. Could I have the first slide, please? Okay, sorry that we're a bit late starting, everybody. Um, in spite of our best attempts at dress rehearsal, one or two things went wrong. So I'm going to be channeling my inner Chris Whitty. And if you hear me say next slide, please, um, that's why. So when I was invited to give this lecture, I wanted to explore different ways in which regulators can make a positive difference to workplace health and safety. Um, I've tried not to overfocus on COVID, but really to look at the experience that I've been through uh, to make references to COVID where it's appropriate, um, and especially where it adds light. And although I'm focusing on health and safety in the workplace, I think that some of the issues that I'm going to talk about this afternoon are equally applicable to regulation in other contexts. So next slide, please. I'd like to put a few pegs in the ground first. I'm waiting for the next slide to pop up. Okay. Um, regulators exist for a very simple purpose. Society has a duty to protect its most vulnerable citizens. And in the case of workplace protection, that dates back to the first Factory Act in 1833. And the state, as we know, empowers regulators and gives them a variety of legal and other tools to use. So given that level of expectation and responsibility, and regulators shouldn't get an easy ride. They have to retain public trust and confidence in their job of reducing harm or reducing risk as part of wider social good. And these are the three areas I think they need to be expert in. The first, in aligning evidence-based problem solving so they can answer the question of what matters. The second, in identifying effective action to recognize and implement measures that work. And thirdly, to stay focused on researching and understanding the evidence space underpinning their choices to help them decide what next. So for the sake of alliteration, I've called those three themes, risk, regulation, and research. And they prompt a really important question, whether or not safety regulators in this case have a sound basis for claiming whether or not they made a positive difference to tackling and reducing levels of workplace risk, resulting in fewer deaths, fewer injuries, and fewer cases of ill health. 
but crucially, what evidence they can adduce in support of those claims. And that is an enormous ask. Good regulatory activity, by which I mean regulatory activity which demonstrates positive and beneficial impact, is really hard to get, to get right. There are many ways that a regulator can look busy, but that's not the same as having an impact. And knowing how, where, and when to put the regulatory effort in is challenging, which is why the second half of my title, Making Work Safer, question mark, is a question mark. Now, the relevant academic research across that whole landscape is referenced in the notes, which I'll make available after this talk. But I feel very strongly that regulators have to contribute to that research. They have to apply direct grounded experience of applying different solutions to practical problems, not least because if you're not writing your own history, someone else will do it for you. And finally, for the avoidance of doubt, the views I'm expressing today are mine and not those of my previous employer. Next slide, please, thank you. So the area that I'm most interested in is the gap between problem analysis and problem solution. That space between the two pieces of the jigsaw where the regulator makes choices. Because simply identifying a risk that needs to be eliminated, reduced, regulated or managed isn't enough on its own. There has to be an actionable response. And regulators, as we know, are always one stage removed from the risk. They don't create the risks in the workplace. They don't own them. They're not directly responsible for overseeing them on a day-to-day -day basis. So their core task has to be to change the behavior of others who do have that directly acting involvement so they can influence what will happen when the regulator isn't there. And that obviously is also very difficult to measure. So when a regulator exercises choice, it's important for several reasons. I think for most of the time, anybody who's worked for a regulatory body will know that they fly under the radar. All of a sudden you may be propelled into the public eye and generally speaking, when regulators are making the news, it's often not with a headline, quote, regulator does something good, unquote. The financial sector has a habit of making negative front page headlines, but contrast that with the rare good news about the work of the MHRA on vaccine approval during the last year. If we ask the public or the working population, what should the regulator do? They might not have an opinion. They might not have thought about it, but if they do, they may give very different answers from what a regulator thinks they would say. And that's important for establishing, maintaining and sustaining public confidence. So I think what that all means is that regulators have to have be very transparent and to give excellent accounts of what they do and to explain why and how they're making a difference rather than just listing things that they've done. Next slide, please. I think there are grounds for saying that COVID has intensified the need for research in at least four of the six areas that Neil earlier referred to around work and well-being, social change and inequality, work and health, and resilience and reliability. But I'm wary of overinterpreting the COVID experience, because as we know, uh, and as the epidemiologist Adam Kucharski has said in the last 12 months, when you've seen one pandemic, you've seen one pandemic. Next slide, please. It's 55 years since the Aberfan disaster, in which 144 people, including 60, 116 school children, died when a massive landslip of coal waste engulfed their school. And the regulatory evolution, which underpins choice, often runs in parallel, but a few steps behind major accidents and the inquiries that result from them. New laws are passed, new regulators are often created on the basis of what went wrong the last time, which is not always a good foundation for the future. Preparing to refight the next to fight the next battle is often more important than refighting the last one. But I can't think of any time recently when this has had to be applied to a health risk on this scale, which is present everywhere, not just in the workplace. I've experienced, many other people on this call will have experienced the long-term ill health impact of substances like asbestos and seen the common regulatory response in specific rules for not just asbestos, but products like lead and going much further back, anthrax, and the obvious contemporary example of a major inquiry is Grenfell. But nothing has raised and tested our public and occupational health resilience like this. And we're also on the brink of the 50th anniversary of the Robins Report, which links to Aberfan, because Lord Robins was the chairman of the NCB at the time of the Aberfan disaster. And one of the key findings there was that the regulatory definition of work was tied to a place, a factory, an office, a railway premises, rather than an activity, and widening the impact to protect more people, not just those at work, 
and the harmful consequences of work clearly had far reaching impact in the intervening 50 years and created a much broader landscape on which the law might apply and where social good might be achieved. I think COVID gives that a further twist. Work isn't just an activity, far less a place. People can be exposed to a virus anywhere, which creates obvious difficulty in drawing boundaries between who does what in protecting the population during all their daily activities, not just when they're working, because as we know, transmission is a continuous risk. And in common with other health related issues, which don't conveniently stay in one place, such as stress or personal well-being, we can see parallels for how hard it is to conceptualize and then define what exactly it is that we want to achieve through regulatory intervention, how and with whom. Next slide, please. So my first question is what matters? How do we know if we've got a problem? What's going on? And I'm gonna call this risk literacy. And I realize I'm dipping my toe into deep water because nowadays risk experts are everywhere. With COVID, there's been a renewed interest in what drives risk perceptions. There've been stern words about how statistics have to be used carefully, including criticism by a select committee of some of the government statistics. There's been predictable concern at the way individual freedoms have been assailed. And the early official briefings are memorably described as number theater. And normally we base our answer on a simple matter of scale high hazard or high risk or both. And I, by using those terms, I mean hazards and risks that are non-trivial. We look at the data for actual or potential deaths, injuries and ill health. We contextualize it. We compare it with other problems we know about. We decide if it crosses a threshold and if so, what action is required and we do something. And we try and avoid controversial, controversial algorithms if we can. COVID clearly meets all the necessary criteria. It's global, the numbers are numbing, but the scale, impact and timing of how that harm actually materialises creates some interesting regulatory challenges. We know more than we did a year ago about how the virus is transmitted and how individuals are infected, by the person to person, in the air or on surfaces. But we don't yet fully understand the relative importance of each of those three routes or how environmental conditions can alter the dynamics of transmission in any given scenario. We also know that the virus doesn't play fair and has brutally exposed vulnerabilities in terms of who contracts it and the deep unevenness of the, of the resulting health outcomes. And we know because people are beginning to report on it, the possible wider social impacts, which could be massive and there could scarcely therefore be a worse opponent. Next slide, please. So as more knowledge emerges, both about the virus, the identification of new variants, how the infection spreads, the behavior of aerosols, and also the controls, whether it's ventilation, facial protection or vaccines, the actions on the regulatory to-do list just change and get longer. And actually, I think I haven't used the word virus risk framing because I think the virus has the exactly parallel challenges to any other risk. Prompts a regulator, whether it's the health and safety executive, a local authority and the workplace health sphere to think about how well it understands what it's dealing with. And those are the questions that are prompted. I'll not go through them all, but you can read who's affected by the risk and how, what's happening to the science and evidence base. If you drop to the last one, the first steps are really important. They give the risk scale, shape and urgency. But it becomes quite difficult then looking on to see what the implications are for the design of workplace interventions. Next slide, please. Because the regulator has to decide on several things. Next slide, Darren. Oh, thank you. Proportionality. How do you balance your regulatory response with a level of risk, especially if it's a novel one? Secondly, where does that risk fit? Oops, we're going ahead of slide. Go back a one. Where does it fit against other risks? Other risks haven't conveniently gone into hibernation while the virus has been around. And thirdly, what are the implications for addressing public and stakeholder expectations and explaining that risk? And critically, in regulatory terms, who is going to do what? Because we readily talk now with varying degrees of confidence, I'm sure, about the R number, infection rates, excess deaths, vaccination of efficacy and effectiveness. And we're all channeling our inner professor, David Spiegelhalter, or our inner, inner Tim Harford, which brings interesting universal challenges about whether we're becoming more risk literate more confused or whether risk remains a foreign language. And these three images here, I think demonstrate why life is confusing. 
The picture on the left is the COVID alert level from the recent winter restrictions, where five is the highest, as in the worst level. On the right is the commonly seen food hygiene writing you see in a shop window or a restaurant. In this case, five is good. Which version of five am I, am I more relaxed about? Which version of five do I prefer? Which makes me feel better? And it's interesting to see statisticians and risk experts using that term. How does the risk number make you feel? I'm reliably informed, by the way, that my bottle of kitchen bleach in the picture in the middle there kills coronavirus. And I'm taking that to mean on surface application only. Because language is important. COVID secure, COVID safe, zero COVID. All phrases we've come to hear being used to justify different approaches or positions in relation to preferred models of risk management or regulatory oversight. As far as I'm aware, none have any legal standing. The idea of zero anything is challenging, as the Chief Medical Officer has reminded us, not least in the world of health and safety. Next slide, please. So what are we to make of a newspaper headline that says a vaccine is safe? Or on the right hand side, what are we to make of a car manufacturer's claim that no one will be seriously injured or killed in a new Volvo car? And what are we to make of the one in the middle? A media headline from our last week saying, um, we must, sorry, what are we waiting for? Things are all heading in the right direction. And all I could hear in my head when I saw that was too soon, too soon, too soon. We could go with a legally correct definition, which I think would be COVID safe, so stroke secure, so far as is reasonably practical. Because when we look at regulators make sense of risk, we must, we must make that tie back to the goal setting legal duties in existing law. The Health and Safety at Work Act is intrinsically precautionary. The duty to carry out a risk assessment is to make it suitable and sufficient, implicit in which is the need it has to be dynamic and responsive as well as effective. When new facts emerge, it's time for an update. It's always surprised me that that explicit duty is so often misinterpreted, sometimes willfully. Because COVID has forcibly shown us the real importance of sense making, first in educating and informing people, and secondly, in charting a path to control it. It demands evidence-based clarity, and that has huge consequences for whoever's job it is to protect people. Next slide, please. I think I lost hours of my HSE career listening to people either trash the idea of assessing risk or trivialising it by taking it to ridiculous extremes. Risk assessment should be the starting point for the conversation, not least because it's marbled into every single decision of importance affecting our future. Who gets the vaccine? When? What are the infection figures telling us? What does that make in terms of, of outcome? What do we do next? When do you reopen workplaces? Which workplaces? Which workplaces do you keep closed? And so on. But I think unfortunately the arguments can be dominated by fears that risk assessment is merely a paper-driven exercise, spawning not only regulatory hyperactivity, but also excessive zeal between businesses who have created their own blue tape version of red tape. And I doubt if I'm alone among current or ex HSE colleagues and sometimes wondering where it all went wrong. I'd settle for good risk control of a perfect paperwork any time. And regular surveys of safety representatives carried out by the TUC, one published very recently, confirmed that the practice and the activity of carrying out risk assessment is an absolutely crucial demonstration of whether an employer is properly committed to workers' health and safety, as well as they're deeply frustrated when they're not properly involved. But the assessment, of course, is absolutely useless without follow through, because the sweet spot of an assessment is to specify the right risk controls. Next slide, please. You can't enter a building site in the country without being bombarded with useful instructions about what controls are in place. Next slide, please. But what about this one? This slide shows a label stuck to the window of a mechanical shovel in a scrapyard. It says, beware, no breaks. It's also, given the workplace context, a risk assessment, albeit not a very good one. It's covered some important elements. It's identified a hazard, there are clearly faulty breaks, and vaguely specified a control. But whether that's an instruction, as in do not use, or a precaution, as in use carefully, isn't clear. It's obviously neither suitable nor sufficient, and this embodies that empty, unfulfilled promise of risk assessment. So if risk is going to be the currency and the language of our discussions in the workplace, there needs to be a basic level of fluency. 
because we cannot deal properly with risks in the workplace without securing effective risk competence. And I'll put a plug in there for the IOSH competence framework, which um, as I've been involved in fairly recently, and there'll be a reference to that in my notes. Next slide, please. So my next question is, what works? My theme here is informed curiosity. If we can have an agreement or an agreed basis on which we talk about scaling and describing risk, what comes next? And the answer, contrary to popular or populist belief, is rarely we need new legislation. The short answer about what works must surely be risk elimination, risk control, risk reduction, risk management, but we need to put flesh on that appealingly simple expectation. In my HSE career, I saw many different and successful in initiatives across many sectors. These range from a full industry approach in the paper industry or the food industry, to specific individual risk-based improvements on reversing cameras and quarries, the elimination of unsafe practices in the steel action industry through widespread adoption of mobile elevating work practices and uh, platforms and so on. I'm also old enough to remember a time when nobody wore a high visibility jacket in circumstances where transport risks were present and nobody wore helmets on construction sites. And it's easy to forget how much transformation in performance has actually been in recent years and how much has been accomplished. Next slide, please. Now, this picture may turn out to be a defining image of the pandemic, but what is the blue thing? Is it a face mask? Is it a face covering? Is it a medical device or a piece of respiratory protective equipment? Who should wear it? When? Will it become a routine personal precaution in future? And will we wonder in years to come how we lived without it? Will wearing a face mask become the respiratory equivalent of wearing a bike helmet or putting on a car seat belt? And will we become social pariahs if we don't wear one? Now we can, we can, we can mull that over, but the answer matters really a great deal if you're a regulator. Because all of those terms have regulatory definitions which determine levels of protection, standards of manufacture, conditions of use, and so on. And regulators have to respect their boundaries because they're set up with a mandate to do specific things, usually enshrined in statute from which there's no easy escape. The powers are aligned with the mandate and also the funding. Performance is assessed on it and reputation relies on delivery. Questions of governance and accountability can often be simply and unambiguously put. This is what you are funded to do. Do it. Thankfully, there's usually a discretionary element. Next slide, please. Where the regulator can choose where to allocate scarce resource to areas where it will have the greatest impact. Next slide. And it, it's likely to include some or all of the following activities. And these happen to be activities. Oops, we've gone on, we've gone on one too far. Never mind. Oh, great. So, and you can see, you can read those yourselves, providing advice, setting standards, carrying out targeted interventions, taking enforcement action to prevent harm, holding people to account when they break the law. The important point to make is very few regulators are one trick ponies. Most regulators have got quite a, a rich menu from which they can choose techniques. But that spectrum in itself can often reshape the way regulators themselves describe what they do. While I was researching this, this, um, this lecture, I saw an advert for the post of the Chief Constable of Greater Manchester. Didn't apply for it. Um, it mentioned the word service twice. It mentioned the word safe twice and partnership three times. There was no mention of crime or any term reflective of wrongdoing. Next slide, please. Professor Malcolm Sparrow, my academic hero, um, talks about regulatory tools as part of regulatory craft and knowing precisely what task needs to be done in order to select the right tool to do it. And in that framework, regulation is an all-inclusive term which basically refers to any activity the regulator deploys. And that has consequences for choice because choice is important in deciding which intervention will achieve the best, and by best I mean best risk-reducing outcome, which is affordable. And with some specific exceptions, such as the functions of competent authority and major hazard legislation, the Health and Safety at Work Act, for example, simply empowers the regulator to make choices about what to do and to explain in public how they were arrived at. The last time the government took a long, hard look at role of regulation was in 2016 in the Regulatory Futures Report. And that concluded that regulators should concentrate on outcomes. They would each select their preferred outcomes from their work based on their sector knowledge, 
and their domain knowledge, and they would then apply different means to achieve results. Now you would think this would be fertile ground for analysis and debate about competing options and a rigorous environment in which to test the accuracy and the robustness of problem definition in the pursuit of better regulatory practice. And those arguments go right the way back to the Robins report that I referred to earlier on. But often I think it's more narrow. The regulator's unique selling point is the remit to exercise the coercive power of the state. Nobody else gets that. And all Great Britain regulators have to publish an enforcement policy statement explaining how they will apply that discretion. Critics of regulatory approaches often point to the low level of prosecution or to the limited density and frequency of interventions as a key measure of performance, which is entirely understandable because these actions are visible and necessary. A prosecution exposes the example of the poor performer both as an incentive to others to do better and to reinforce when the limits of acceptable duty holder behavior have been breached. Public naming and shaming ensures others take note and ideally change their behavior to avoid a similar fate. Fines based on the sentencing guidelines can reflect the level of public disapproval and provide assurance that justice is not only being delivered, but being seen to be delivered. Visible intervention with duty holders has a similar effect and confirms the presence of the regulator on the ground. So those activity levels should be part of the performance picture. But it's also reasonable to ask how much risk reduction that approach produces and compared to others. Next slide, please. Because if all you have is a hammer, everything looks very much like a nail. And I think there's some interesting examples in COVID here, because new enforcement powers, as we know, are being given to the police and to local authorities. Stay at home, as a phrase first uttered in March 2020, the term critical worker has been defined and certain categories of workplace were legally required to remain shut, whereas others weren't. But it's unclear to me whether the stay at home requirement can be actually enforced against employers who don't allow their employees or discourage them from working at home when they could. The Hansard Society keeps a running total of the number of coronavirus related statutory instruments that have been laid before Parliament going back to March 2020. And at the end of March 2021 20, this, this year, that figure stood at 470 or 32 percent of all the statutory instruments laid, which I think is an amazing figure, astonishingly high. In February, the National Police Chiefs Council reported that police in England and Wales had issued nearly 70,000 fixed penalty notices for breaches of coronavirus restrictions up to that date, while emphasising that they saw enforcement as a last resort after engagement, explanation and encouragement. And all of this legislation under coronavirus is clearly deeply and heavily prescriptive. The data, by the way, didn't actually to say how many of the resulting fines had also been collected. The HSE local authority equivalent in the United States, the OSHA, has powers to serve citations for violations of safety standards rather than as an overt punishment. And they published data for 2020, which showed that they collected nearly $4 million from 300 employers for a variety of corona related uh, violations. Now those figures look miserable to me, but importantly, I think they only deal with symptoms rather than causes of management failure, which I think is a pretty poor approach. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The next slide is a toilet bowl, um, which is my slide showing nudge. I don't know if we're gonna get to it. Are we gonna get to it? Uh, yes, there you go. Um, because COVID and the way people have behaved in response to COVID um, has, has really brought the behavioral change people out as well, which I think is absolutely right. Um, questioning the extent to which punitive action works, both with the public and with, with workplace and everywhere else. But I think that it's really important to note that one of the things that we should take positively from COVID is the fact that these this sorts of activity, these sorts of conversations are now being had much more openly. Next slide, please. I want to consider um, a bunch of regulatory settings now just to give some flavour about what I mean when I'm talking about what works. Top left hand picture is an offshore oil platform. And I put that one on because I want to talk about natural gas. Because natural gas goes on a journey from users, to, to users rather, from offshore installations through buried gas mains on dry land and finally into cookers and domestic appliances. And operators of both offshore and onshore installations have to provide a safety case to the regulator to demonstrate, <coughs> excuse me, they properly considered 
the major accident scenarios that could give rise to a catastrophic incident. And those date back to various catastrophic incidents, not least of which was Piper Alpha in 1988, which killed 167 people. These regimes are demanding both for the operator and for the regulator who exercises close supervision. But a primary purpose is to provide assurance that significant hazards are under effective operator control. And the pipeline operators additionally need to abide by a formal agreement for replacing cast iron gas mains and replacing them with polyethylene pipework. And when the gas comes into the domestic setting through a cooker, a different regime applies, checking and maintenance typically annually by a third party gas safety engineer resulting in a gas certificate. So face to face is part of, but by no means the only regulatory element under each of these permissioning scenarios. It's the high potential hazard rather than a high level of risk per se, which figures significantly in the choice of intervention. And there is a heavy level of assurance. But of course, most regimes aren't permissioned or permissioning based. Most regimes are permissive. There's no need to obtain regulatory approval or permission to operate nor to routinely provide any physical proof of compliance. And that has a big effect on the design of regulatory response. The bottom left picture is, mild, is, is, is a welder and scientific evidence showing that exposure to all welding fume, including mild steel fume, could cause lung cancer and possibly kidney cancer, resulted in reclassification of the fume as carcinogenic and therefore a need for upping the level of control. There's no indication, as far as I'm aware, that that new level of risk warranted immediate prohibition, but neither could it be ignored. The need for urgency and shifting to a new set of expectations, which affects the approach, the mix and the scale of engagement, education, advice and enforcement. You have to bring duty orders up to a new level of awareness and compliance. You can't simply drop the news on them and expect instant, instant uh, compliant response. And I think that echoes some of the challenges we've seen with COVID. It also raises an interesting operational question about how long to give duty holders to reach the necessary level of competence and when to stop accepting novelty as an excuse for doing nothing. I show the picture of the forklift truck simply because the legal linearity there is, is basic and simple. If you drive a fork truck in any workplace setting, you have to be trained to the standards set out in the approved code of practice. But I include the picture of the fairground to make a, a different point. Um, when members of the public enter the equation, that regulatory design takes on a different texture. And with fairgrounds, of course, the intrinsic challenge is how do you scare the wits out of people that do it safely? And although relatively rare, we know that fairground accidents can be fatal, often involve vulnerable groups like children, and always attract close media interest. And we saw a fine within in the first three months of this year of a, of a fairground operator, of a million pound fine after the death of a small child. So the regulatory regime there is, is, is different again, focusing on the activity of ride examiners and also targeted inspection of individual rides and where appropriate safety alerts delivered by the regulator on items like bouncy castles. But in all of these examples, the choice about what works has been informed and shaped by different characteristics of the risk hazard mix and who critically is impacted. Next slide, please. And sometimes an event completely shatters the legitimacy of the prevailing system and points to the need for a major reboot with new regulatory architecture. Point for a slide, point for a slide, there we go. And the classic example is, is Grenfell. New regulator and a new, a new set of legislation to try and rectify the flaws introduced by previous dismantling of regulatory protection. Dame Judith Hackett concluded her independent examination of building regulations and fire safety by saying this, quote, there is a cultural issue across the sector which can be described as a race to the bottom, caused either through ignorance, indifference, or because the system does not facilitate good practice. There's insufficient focus on delivering the best quality building possible in order to ensure that residents are safe and feel safe. And more recently, We've seen interviews with a new chief inspector of buildings, and he said that unambiguously what that means in his terms in translating the problem diagnosis into an assertive enforcement focused regulatory response. And of course, the big challenge here is how do you achieve major cultural change through new legislation? Next slide, please. So with all of these examples, the prevailing regime reflects decisions about the regulator's assessment of risk, 
and the proportionality of an intervention choice based on these topics. The scale of the actual potential harm, whether it's catastrophic or non-catastrophic, novel or known, individual, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you can read those. So tailoring those answers to that set of questions and that set of criteria is, is, is one challenge, but they are, regulatory interventions are not, as we know, endlessly flexible because the transaction between the regulator and the duty holder or via an intermediary to the duty holder can create problems of its own. One-to-one -one interaction with an inspector provides a tight, controllable and repeatable mechanism to apply consistency. When you introduce distance between the regulator and the duty holder, that may not remain the case, so intermediaries become very important and potentially vulnerable parts of the system. But with five million workplaces from which to choose, you know, a one-to-one -one philosophy, I think, is as pointless as it is ill-conceived. Next slide, please. And while the regulator can play a significant role in shaping how the overall health and safety system performs, others have to play their part as well. There are numerous important players, employers, trade associations, trade unions, health and safety professionals, and many others, because we know the regulators are too small, far too small to do all the heavy lifting on their own. And if we start applying that thinking to COVID, there are opportunities clearly to act either unilaterally or in a collaboration at different points in the risk cycle. Next slide, please. And the sooner the intervention, the greater the prospects for effective removal of risk. Just reading what's been happening the last 12 months, whether it's through select committee um, appearances or whether it's through on the website, it's clear to me that HSE and local authorities um, are carrying out a vast range of activity across the COVID front. There are three headings, four headings there rather, regulatory options before the point of risk, at the point of risk, after the point of risk, and across all stages. And the, point, the first obvious point I'd like to make really is that how much risk reducing activity can be addressed before risk materializes, where you can develop and fine tune and hone and shape and scale tactics to assist duty holders both those who instinctively want to get things right and those who aren't going to get things right and need, and need encouragement uh, and, and material to do so. I, mean, I think these headings also make an important point as far as I'm concerned. Um, you will see that proactive intervention with duty holders and reactive investigations come further down the list, but also I never thought, I've never thought it was possible to inspect your way through or out of a risk that whole menu, that whole spectrum has to come into play. And you would expect, tactically, a smart regulator to maximise the amount of front-end activity to try and head as many problems off as soon as possible. You obviously still need to be doing proactive intervention, you need to be doing reactive work, but actually, wouldn't you want to maximise your upstream activity as far as you possibly could? So I've got that list. One of the ways that we could look at that and say, okay, there's a variety of things that we could do. Take market surveillance. We can, we've got a market surveillance function. We can use that to decide whether or not personal protective equipment is fit for purpose. We've got a template risk assessment guidance uh, approach we can take. How do we communicate that to people through social media? How do we communicate that to people through bulletins, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? How do we, how do we organize our scientific research on aerosols, ventilation, transmission? How do we do all of that stuff? But actually, Rather than say, what can I use this tool for? The theme of my talk really has been as much about, let's come at it from the other direction. Next slide, please. What's the problem we're trying to solve here? Or what's the set of problems that are interacting with each other that we're trying to solve? Which of the problems are we content to ignore? How do we describe and articulate risk reduction potential? What are the relative strengths and weaknesses of the tools in the box? Do we need new ones? What's the best mix? So on and so on and so on. Next slide, please. Because that conjures to me not an image of a hammer and a nail, but of a music engineer's desk with different activities faded up or down, depending on where they're needed and in what mix and in what intensity and for how long at different points to create a blended regulatory result. Nothing is ruled out, but the balance is crucial. And that that really adds another point. You need a real mix of skills and knowledge to do this. Regulatory effectiveness, to coin a phrase, this menu needs different chefs if it's going to work. And regulators need good design teams, good analysts, good statisticians, good scientists, good inspect 
directors, good policy makers. They need all of those skills and they need them in buckets to be able to do this well. Next slide, please. So my final theme is focused operational research. If the regulator successfully aligns risk with a tailored and proportionate regulatory response, what comes next? Is that the job finished? How do we get ready for the next set of workplace risk challenges while eliminating or suppressing the ones that we already know about? What's the transferable knowledge? What risks will require completely new solutions? And is the past any guide to what we should be thinking about? So my third question really then is what research does the regulator need to be doing to maintain their capabilities, maintain their cutting edge horizon scanning and to develop new approaches to mitigate and suppress risk? Because good regulation isn't static and it certainly isn't free and it's definitely not cheap. And the more successful the regulator becomes in removing workplace risk, the less visible the wins, the more likely it is that the work is unappreciated and the greater the existential threat, things just get harder. So where do you look? Next slide, please. To me, it's obvious, and I, I'm, I'm not saying anything that many colleagues, ex-colleagues won't know already, you have to think about the effect you're having. How do you know if you're hitting the right targets or just randomly firing arrows at a problem? Being busy rather than being effective. Because this isn't just about making good selections. It's also about recycling and learning from experience to specify what success looks like in order to build, create, and sustain better interventions in future. And of course, this is where it gets really messy because it's easier to count things than it is to tell compelling stories about what you've done. And that's not necessarily the regulator's fault because they're routinely held to account for doing stuff. When my son was young and I picked him up from school, I'd ask him what he'd done that day. And I suspect in common many other parents, the response would be a single grunted word. He'd say stuff. And I'd say, okay, um, any, any, any advance on stuff? Nah, never advance on stuff. And likewise for a regulator, doing stuff is a much less compelling response than here's how we change the world for the better today. So how easily and how readily can regulators tell the stories that they show what they did in reducing risk? Next slide, please. And some of that language already exists. It's in the control hierarchy. And COVID shone a bright light on the continuing importance of this hierarchy, which was of course around pre-pandemic, but it's nice to see it making a much more prominent reappearance. Words like eliminate, substitute, reduce, control, are powerful words, powerful verbs that we should get used to using more. Next slide, please. As for where to go for looking for problems and apologies for the length of the list, these strike me as being research areas where actually COVID now has given a green light to saying, this is where we should be looking. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of them. Uh, the two ones that appeal to me, most of the last two regulatory craft and regulatory design frameworks, because they potentially expose gaps of examples or problems that can't be addressed by a single regulator. If the risks are messy, we can't expect the corresponding response to be easy. And the obvious example in the field, in the occupational safety and health field, is the overlap with labour protection and with public health. We've seen how coronavirus impacts on different groups to amplify pre-existing inequalities, and the extensive media coverage of poor conditions in certain types of workplaces where employees haven't been able to self-isolate or haven't been able to afford foregoing loss of wages because they're too frightened to come into work. And I think there've been positive wider moves on improving workers' rights, such as the decision on providing PPE to workers and the recent decision about Uber terms and conditions. Next slide, please. So my initial challenge was, what is the link between problem and solution? And I don't really want to offer any glib solutions or glib views on what I think that should be. Next slide, please. At some point, presumably, the COVID risk will, will start to stabilize. Um, I don't know what that means in terms of giving you precise detail, but I think it will stabilize. And I was impressed, I have to say, to see a recent BBC website article explaining COVID precautions in terms of the Swiss cheese model. Uh, again, the reference will be in the notes. And I thought process safety thinking has finally entered the mainstream, brilliant. But is work getting safer? I think the chances of seeing improvements must surely improve if regulators can confidently select mix and apply all the available tools that I've talked about and all the other ones to give persuasive and compelling accounts of where they've succeeded and also where they haven't. 
because the regulator who can pull that off is in a much more powerful position both to describe and demonstrate value and to win resources to do what they think is needed. And this, if you like, is the 15 second version of the talk. Can, if you're a regulator, can you complete the following sentences in persuasive, compelling ways? This risk is important because this regulatory solution will reduce risk because this research will help further reduce risk because. Implicit in everything I've said is the importance of developing and sustaining a proper sense of curiosity and of proportionality and devising effective ways to make workplaces safer and healthier. And I've argued that that means that regulators have not only to use all the tools in the toolbox, but to constantly assess whether or not they're working as they intended and to adjust the mix accordingly. Next slide, please. This year is the 20th birthday of the publication of the HSE document R2P2, Reducing Risks, Protecting People, not to be confused with the Star Wars robot. Considered to be groundbreaking at the time, the conversation about risk has nonetheless moved on significantly in the intervening years. And I was actually quite surprised when I went back and reread R2P2 recently just to see how far that had gone. But it would be a shame if our recent experience with COVID in particular didn't improve that collective ability to frame, shape and improve our understanding and control of work-related risk. Slide, please. And based on observing the experience from outside the tent so far, for me, these will be the insights for regulatory development, regulatory thinking and future. Focused on the outcome, reduce significant risk, significant harm. Take time to properly define the problem so you can exercise choice carefully. Maintain the unique selling point of the regulator, that ability to apply coercive state power. You lose that, you lose your raison d'etre, you start to look insignificant. Tell compelling stories, focus on the basics, risk assessment and risk control. Let's take advantage of the fact they've been rejuvenated. Stay on top of the evidence, make sure you don't lose your scientific capability and accept the fact that regulation is always gonna be dynamic. And next and final slide, please. For many years, um, I felt contractually obliged almost to use this quote from Professor Malcolm Sparrow, but today I'm finishing with it. And I hope based on what I've said up to now, It'll be obvious why I've done that. So thank you. And I think we go to questions now. Thanks Thanks for doing the slides, Darren, and across to Neil and Andrew. Thanks very much indeed, David. And uh, when Neil and I were working out who to invite to give our, our first uh, inaugural Thomas Ashton lecture, we wanted somebody who we knew would be thought provoking, insightful and relevant. And I think it's fair to say that you've delivered in spades uh, on all three counts there. So thank you so much indeed for the presentation. Uh, just a, a quick apology, there was a bit of delay, I think, uh, which is why some of the slides are a bit slow. So apologies for that live stream delay issue. But as David said, now's the time to move to questions. Uh, please feel free to ask the questions in the chat. They'll be uh, moderated through to uh, myself and Neil. And David, if we can start uh, with a question that doesn't focus on COVID, but highlights one of the other potential challenges that regulators are going to face, and that's about digital transformation. So how do you expect the digital transformation agenda to impact on conventional risk management? I'm probably going to have to betray um, a certain lack of knowledge about whether the questioner meant that in, in a broad or a narrow sense, but let me give one narrowly focused answer. Um, I mean, one of the things that the digital transformation of, of, of process enables people to do is, is to do all that business process engineering stuff and to look and see the extent to which you know modern business practices are being applied not just to modern business practice but to modern health safety well-being and so on but if i'm looking at it from a regulatory perspective i would have thought and i'm i'm, I'm trying to dredge up some ideas from when, when i was still working but the extent to which the, the regulator can short circuit some of, the, some of the questions by having really good digital capability, making sense of trends, making sense of accidents, incidents, ill health, near misses, harnessing that sort of material in order to get a jump start on dealing with problems, defining problems better, I think is, is the big digital transformation issue for me. And I, I'm sorry if the questioner expected a more broadly based answer than that, but just from that particular regulatory perspective, that would be the, that would be the angle I would come in on. Andrew, you look as if I 
I'm passing over to Neil now. Oh, so. sorry. You just look very serene there, oh. that's all. Just a moment <laughs> before passing on to Neil. Okay, another question that's come through, David, and, and thank you from me for an excellent talk too. How should the regulator ensure that the duty holder retains effective intelligent customer capability when there's an ever increasing reliance on the supply chain for risk management services? Right. Okay, well, it, it's, sometimes, it's sometimes tempting to view the term duty holder or, or as a kind of a dumb terminal. Um, and to assume that, you know, the duty holder is simply waiting there to be told what to do in order, in order to manage health and safety. When, of course, you know, the, the fundamental guiding principle in the Act is you, you make the risk, you create the risk, you control it. Now, it's very easy to say that when your entire universe is contained within a fairly small contained geographical or economic bubble. But I think that that, that, that issue with extended supply chains, I actually see that as a huge opportunity. Um, notwithstanding what I said in the lecture about blue tape and, about, and in some respects, you know, I think my interpretation would be that businesses are often more brutal in terms of their demands on duty holders than, than the regulator ever is. But leaving that to one side, you know, the supply chain is an enormously powerful way of ensuring that you don't you don't amplify problems the further down the supply chain that you go. And it's perfectly legitimate for a duty holder to dig their heels in and say, you know, this supply chain is just getting far too elongated. It's, there's no control in it anymore. And actually, when you look at some of the stuff that's been happening about, about third world and about, um, uh, you know, Boohoo and these other big food and um, uh, clothing manufacturers, you see some green shoots there, but not enough. Um, and I think actually, you know, there, there is a regulatory component to that as well, because if regulatory boundaries are complicated within countries, they're ever more complicated beyond countries. And, and when we were still in the EU, and I used to meet my counterparts in other European countries, that supply chain management was always, always a great Nirvana type aim we should be aspiring to. But when you looked at 28 countries trying to control that, it was really, really complicated. So I accept the fact that it's a, it's a, it's a really good challenge. It's a really important area to be on top of, but I do think it's very, very hard. And I do sympathize with the duty holder at the very end of a very long elongated supply chain. Great. Thanks very much for that, David. And um, one of the things that you've mentioned throughout your talk is the Health and Safety Work Act. And of course, Health and Safety Work Act uh, came in in 1974, a long time ago now. Um, and I'm just wondering whether you think that act is fit for the future, given the challenges that we're going to have with the changing world of work, the changing demography, the issues around gig workers that you've described, and whether it's time for us to tear up the Health and Safety and Work Act and go with something that's perhaps more suited to the modern world. Right, okay. Well, Andrew, I wouldn't tear it up, um, certainly not. But let's just sort of go, go back a step and say, you know, the Robins Report was produced um, in response to a specific set of circumstances. And the specific set of circumstances was that the widespread perception was that the the entire health and safety arrangements at the time, um, prescriptive, uh, mountains of legislation. Uh, the, the word that Robins used, which always stuck with me, was that the, the characteristic uh, uh, approach was, was based on apathy. Duty holders waited for an inspector to come and tell them what to do. But I think the, the present context, if we, if we sat down and wrote down five things that you would say were contextually important in 2021, the first thing you wouldn't write down would be apathetic duty holders. I think the first thing you'd write down would be work and employment in the, in the round, the socioeconomic consequences of working in different ways, the labour relations, the ways in which employers and employees interact now. You would look at a very different spectrum of risk in the background, because for all of that structural change in industry and all of the fact, I mean, I think the figure when Robins reported was something like 650 fatalities every year, many of them in factories. And of course, expanding that to outside factories, uh, the figure would be much, much higher. Um, but I think if you look at what Robins covered, I mean, Robins covered things like the local authority link. He covered things like public health. He covered things like whether or not there should be an insurance premium and whether the insurance industry should bear more of a burden. So in answer to your question, the first thing I would do would be, would be not to tear it up. The second thing I would do would be to go back and see how many of the issues that Robins flagged 
actually are still around 50 years later. And the third thing I would do would be to say, OK, let's get some clever researchers, preferably from the Thomas Ashton Institute, to put their heads together and say how many of the present research themes that we are doing have got a contributory influence on shaping the way in which the 2021 version of Robins ought to start its work. Oh, and by the way, don't forget the gig economy. Sorry, yes, yeah, yes. Thanks, David. Okay, great. So another point here is that, that, that there's a lot of uh, public trust in decisions that requires trustworthy decision makers. And in, particularly in these times, um, that means that you have to be very honest about the uncertainty uh, in what's, uh, what the evidence that you're putting forward is. And obviously that means that uh, regulation and decisions might change as the knowledge gap closes. Do you think that that is sufficiently recognized in the way that regulations uh, are operated? I think the short answer is that the, the, the appetite for certainty, and we're all guilty of it, you know, we're all guilty of it in different ways, but the appetite for uncertainty, um, I think often underestimates the extent to which certainty is impossible. Um, and I mean, we've all been through quite an interesting experience in the last 15 months, haven't we? You know, we've all had to come to terms with the extent to which we are beholden to or dismissive of, um, you know, government advice, the extent to which we've all been rule breakers or rule followers. Uh, and when, when people talk about this, you know, clever, clever risk people talk about this and they talk about who do you believe? Um, and, you know, Professor Chris Whitty and Sir Patrick Vallance um, versus politicians is, is one conversation. But if somebody stands up from the regulator and you look at the chief exec of the MHRA standing up and talking about vaccine, for example, um, you can't help but think, or you can't help form a little picture in your head, do I trust this person? Um, so I think whilst there's a, there's a bigger societal question around that, the extent to which we trust people who tell us things or don't trust people who tell us things that we think aren't true, the scary bit for me coming out of this is as much about what have I learned about myself and therefore what have we all learned about ourselves in terms of our thirst for, need for, dismissal of, you know, effective risk advice. Um, I, I, I'll be honest, I've become incredibly risk averse in, in the last 15 months, much to my surprise and consternation, but I've just become incredibly risk averse and I don't, I don't think I was a particularly sort of gung-ho risk taker to begin with. Um, so maybe I'm conforming to the uh, the perception of regulators being boring and all the rest of it. But I, I think that wider question about trust, we, we crave people to tell us the truth, but we don't often give them credit for saying that they don't know something. And I think if you look at stuff like the, the stuff that David Spiegelhalter talks about, that Tim Harford talks about, they are basically saying, give people a break when they're talking about risk. So that's not a very clean answer, Neil, but that's the best I can come up with. Okay, that's great, David, thanks. Thanks, David. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that, that's coming out from the questions is that uh, very often the regulation of risk is, is easier in larger organisations. And of course, the majority of, of uh, businesses in the UK are small to medium sized enterprises. So given that and the growth in the gig economy that we talked about earlier and those fragmented employment relationships that we now see in many industries, um, how do you think these should be tackled effectively from the regulator's perspective to ensure that risk is adequately controlled throughout the uh, UK economy uh, and not just in, in those large organisations that can perhaps afford uh, to invest in it? OK, um, well, it's, it's, it's a really good question because, you know, the, the COVID, is just, is, COVID has amplified what was already uh, a risk appreciation, risk awareness risk control approach with small and medium sized companies, didn't it? I mean, HSC has never pretended and local authorities have never pretended that the SME population was, was A, easy to reach or B, easy to influence. So, you know, if, if I run through the kind of things that would strike me there about how do you, if the, if the question is a different way of putting it, if the question is, how do we make sure SMEs aren't left behind? How do we make sure SMEs have got the material and the evidence and the information on which to make good risk-based decisions? If you're an SME, I mean, I'm going to make a massive jump of uh, uh, faith here. If you're an SME operating a reasonably small, well-contained business, um, I would really major on the control hierarchy. 
Um, I would really give um, in, in communication from the regulator and that push communication, um, as well as social media, as well as all the public statements. I think HSC has been doing this, by the way, um, and local authorities too. I would really push the control hierarchy to simplify it. I think, you know, it's understandable if people haven't been shown what the control hierarchy is to say, it's, it's okay, we've given everybody PPE. And we know that that, you know, race to the bottom, literally of the, of the inverted apex is not a good risk management approach. But saying to people, you know, okay, what is the simplest way we can convey the idea of the control hierarchy? And you know, it, it is still a legal requirement, of course, that no matter how big an organization you are, you have to have some competent health and safety advice. But how, how competent, how difficult is it to make um, somebody aware of the control hierarchy so they can say, look, we can eliminate, we can substitute, we can engineer, we can admin control, we can use PPE. I, I think you know the, the, the emphasis there for me would be for the regulator's point of view to push that really powerfully, to push it not just directly to duty holders, but through trade associations, third parties, trade unions, employers groups, all those other people, occupational safety and health professionals. But then from the duty holder point of view, maybe it's a kind of a plea, look, it isn't as complicated as you think, but don't take shortcuts. So that would be my answer to that one, Andrew. Thank you, David. Okay, that's, that's great. I wonder, in your opinion, will there be a need for a regulator in health and safety in 20 years, 30 years, 50 years time? That again, sorry, Neil, I missed the beginning of that. Do you think there'll be a need for a regulator in health and safety in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Um, yes, because we will never get to the point where you know the world is as good as we'd like it to be. I mean, uh, and I'm not saying that as an exercise in sort of self-preservation or, or self-preservation on behalf of ex-colleagues. Um, you can apply the same question to, will we still need the police in 50 years? Um, uh, will we still need the National Health Service? Well, you can, you can make a different argument there, but will we still need somebody to act as society's regulator? And I think the answer is yes, because society, for all the fact society may be becoming a better, more empathetic, better, nice place, more sympathetic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, there will always be people who won't see it that way. And there will always be an, it, it's interesting, maybe the question is, is, is better answered if I say, that maybe if there was a narrowing of the people on whom the regulator needed to focus attention, that would be a legitimate way of charting the progress towards a better health and safety aware society. Um, but I think I've, I've signed up to that my whole of my working career and seen small but quite small incremental steps towards it. I think if the question is, is society intrinsically going to get better? Well, maybe coming out of COVID we will. Maybe COVID will have far more reaching, wide reaching consequences than we yet realise. That's a really existential sure question, by the way. <laughs> it's a really <laughs> existential question, so I'm struggling to give you a good answer. Uh, thanks for that, David. That's great. The great news is, David, we've got a long list of existential questions for you because there's some great questions coming from our audience. So the next one, uh, which again is, I think, a really interesting one, is <coughs> how often do you think the system needs a catastrophic failure event to shock the system to refocus minds? How's that changed and will it need to be more or less frequent now? All right, OK. Okay. Well, I would prefer if there weren't catastrophic incidents. That's the first thing. So one of the things that used to used to bug me was the extent to which, um, and you know, if I think of, of the catastrophic incidents that were in that happened when I was in HSC, you had the Bradford football fire, you had the Hillsborough disaster, you had Buntsfield, you had a series of major incidents at chemical plants, which didn't always result in fatalities, like associated Octel, Hickson and Welsh, which was fatalities. And, and you looked at them and you thought, are these telling us anything fundamentally new? And I think well, there was one sort of, there was one constant theme through all of them, which was leadership. And it almost became a cliche to say, you know, incident X, catastrophe Y happened because of a complete collapse and a failure of leadership. Uh, and that may well be true. And in some cases more true than others. But if you actually unpack that and say, what was it that leadership failed to do? Um, Either leadership failed to take the eye off the ball, it, 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 it took the eye off the ball, or there were things it could, should, didn't do. But I suppose my, my, my instinctive curiosity was how do you, and I, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not inventing this on the hoof, by the way, I genuinely did think about this. How do you artificially recreate 
the urgency and the incentivization of a major incident without having a major incident. And the reality, I mean, in the major hazards field, the phrase that used to be used, um, as I, having said that, I've, said, I've instantly forgotten about it. Um, you, you had to be worried, but not so worried you couldn't sleep. And again, you know, proportionality, if, if, you, if you're in a major hazard business and you make stuff that can go bang or poison people, you've signed up to the, to the premiership in terms of risk control. If you, if you make bread buns, or you make wrapping paper, you, you, you're operating at a different level, but you still got to maintain that proportionality and that consistency of approach. So I would prefer there weren't major incidents, but if there are major incidents, we should suck every last drop of learning out of them. And I think sometimes that isn't possible because they, they, the inquiries, the aftermath go on too long. Um, but I also think that, you know, part of the response to a major incident has to be, how could we have created this, this incentive, this seismic shock, in real time without having to harm or kill people. So that would be my answer to that. Thanks, David. Okay. Um, I wonder, do you think, David, there are any aspects of the, of the regulatory craft that you think UK does particularly well? Yes. I think, I think we do try and use all the tools in the box. I think we've got a helpful starting point with the Health and Safety at Work Act because it is enabling. I think it's the fact it's goal setting and the fact it gives the regulator the, the opportunity to choose what to do, albeit they've got to make arrangements for effective enforcement is, is enabling. I think where we, where we aren't quite so good um, and where I've always thought that, you know, there was room for more discussion was around the, the totality of labour protection and the totality of the worker in the workplace, not just as a result of health and safety exposures, but as a result of wider labor inspection type um, uh, exposure. But I think, well, I think, you know, without, without blowing HSE's trumpet too loudly, the fact the HSE still exists after 50 years, after all the trials and tribulations it's been through, you know, echoing back one of the earlier questions about should we tear up the Health and Safety at Work Act, Health and Safety at Work Act got an awful lot right. And in, in days gone by, I used to give regular lectures to visiting people and, and I would say to them, look, I've got a fight, hang on. I would hold up my copy of Redgrave and I'd say, you know, this is the book of rules and they'd all gasp in horror. And I'd say, but you know what, there's only two pages, there's only two pages matter, sections two to six of the act, section seven and eight and the powers of inspectors. And, and I wasn't being glib, I wasn't being facetious or anything like that. I just, but for all of that legislation, it boils down to risk creation, risk management, risk control. And I think that's where the UK has done it, has done it well. Um, so I think on, on balance, I would put us on the right hand side of the, of the band. That's brilliant. Thanks, David. I hope this isn't feeling too much like the uh, Spanish Inquisition, David, but... Uh, well, nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition, Andrew, so... <laughs> so um, on that note, let, let's move on to the next question. Um, and an interesting one from, from the, 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 the technical and scientific perspective. So do you think the public and duty holders are now better able to understand and cope with scientific uncertainty and the scientific process since the pandemic? And if so, how should health and safety regulators make best use of this opportunity? Well, the, my, my first reaction is, my goodness me, I hope they are. I really do. Um, if, if, if it does become the case that, you know, the population at large comes to a better appreciation and understanding of what, of what, 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 what the difference is, I mean, the, at the very beginning of the pandemic, there was that interesting um, phrase, we're following the science. And then that very quickly became, um, well, we're not, we're not following all of the science, we're informed by the science. And there was a bit of sort of, there was a bit of verbal jousting around which, whether we were following, chasing, ignoring, or whatever it was with the science. So I, I just think those are such difficult concepts for all of us to grasp. And, you know, I include myself in that, you know, I, I spent, again, you know, spent a lot of time thinking about this, as I'm sure we all have. Um, but ultimately, what does it boil down to? You know, I, I, one of the questions Neil phrased was, do you trust who's telling you something? And, and do you trust them because they're telling you what you want to hear? Or do you trust them because they're telling you what they know and they're, they're, they're making sure that you know the limits to what they know? Um, I mean, is that, that phrase Jeremy Paxman used to use about when he was interviewing politicians, and apologies for swearing, but he, his, his approach to interviewing politicians was, why is this bloody liar lying to me? 
And you know, if you start from that level of negativity, you you only end up being uh, you know confirmed in your disappointment. Um, I mean, I'm sounding a bit Pollyanna-ish here, but if if one of the real societal consequences of COVID is that we all have a better understanding and appreciation, first of all, of what it is that worries us and bothers us, and secondly, what level of certainty we're prepared to live with, forego, or ignore in our daily lives, that has to be a good thing. But the second half of the question, I think that's a really interesting challenge for regulators, because having said in my answer to the SME question, make it simple and understandable, if you oversimplify it and, and, and do too much in diluting it down, you may actually lose the point. So I think that's where you know the, the, the regulatory scientific and, and expertise uh, and the ability to make sense of stats, make a sense of risk, make sense of hazard. It's a never ending challenge, isn't it? They've got to keep on talking, keep on telling people. And especially people like you, Andrew, <laughs> because you are HSE's chief clever person. Uh... I accept that with with great humility. <laughs> he has a huge number of very clever people. Uh, Neil, back to you before it all gets a bit too much. Uh, I can't possibly comment on any of that, Andrew. But there, there is a particularly uh, interesting point that uh, that one of the, the questions that's come in has made, um, and and it's one that I, I've seen in in my time looking at HSC and its operations, and that's. When you have a, a, a regulation that's based on some scientific process, uh, some scientific test of some sort or another, and then that product fails, and we might be thinking there of Renful, uh, we might be thinking perhaps of another example and that of uh, self-driving cars that crash into walls and, and kill the people behind the wheels. Where does the responsibility lie in there? Um, does it lie with the scientists? Does it lie with the, uh, the system? Is there a, a hierarchy of process that we need to bring in to control those? Where, where do you see responsibility sitting within an event like that? Okay. Um, well, I think you know, that if, if I break it down into two parts, if, if you've got a physical component that fails, you know, scientists will be able to tell you how it failed, why it failed. And you think of something like the Challenger and the, and the, the, the Columbia disasters when there were specific bits of the shuttles that failed, whether it was the O-rings or whether it was the, the insulation on the outside. And there was a scientific explanation for that. And I guess, you know, as I'm saying that, I'm thinking, well, well, how come that scientific failure or that physical failure saw it right through to disaster? What were, the, what were the barriers that were between that physical failure and the ultimate catastrophe? Um, and, you know, the, the literature on both of those incidents is really interesting, as I'm sure you know, Neil. The, you know, the O-ring failure was not just about the fact the O-rings became brittle at very low temperatures. It was about the fact that there was an argument going on in the background between engineers and scientists saying, yeah, but that's OK, because we've, we've normalised that risk. We've accepted that risk can arise and we're happy with it. We're not, we're not happy is the wrong word. We're content that we can manage that risk. So when the sun rose on the day that the, uh, the, the shuttle disaster took place and it was freezing cold temperatures, you know, all of the worst fears of some people were realized when that thing took off and blew. And I think there were a lot of people actually in NASA and beyond who looked at that and thought, oh my God, we knew that was gonna happen. So I think, I, I wouldn't use the word blame, because um, that's, that's obviously a loaded term, but it, it goes back again to this, 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 this regulatory mindset, which is often assumed to be, let's find out who, what went wrong and punish somebody for it. And often that, that is perfectly legitimate. It, it, there is a very simple linear relationship between fault and failure of, of, of parties, but it, it's the procedural bits in between, which is where I think you know, the scientific versus the legal questions get really, really interesting, which of course is exactly what's been happening at Grenfell. And, you know, listening to the witnesses at Grenfell talk about the integrity of, of cladding, the integrity of the fire tests, the, the subterfuge and the meretricious behaviour behind the scenes to, to manipulate those tests, which appears to be coming across at the, in the evidence, um, there was no way some of that material was fit for purpose. So the question is not, is not why did it fail? It's how did it manage to get through so many holes in the Swiss cheese model to then fail catastrophically on the outside of the building? So I guess ultimately, Neil, um, sorry to sort of go all history and philosophy of science on you, but you know, science is not the pure, history, it's not the pure, science isn't the pure activity we like to think it is because it's moderated, isn't it, by law and by convention. 
It's governed by humans, and that's the, the, the whole uh, flaw in the entire system. <laughs> and in that particular case, I mean, the shuttle disaster, we took Richard Feynman, the Nobel laureate, to actually um, get them to admit what the precise uh, fault in the incident was. So yeah. that's brilliant. Thanks, David. I think we've got time for just one more question. I wanted to try and finish on one that brought together uh, people, risk, tolerability, all in, in one nice uh, meaty question for you, David. So um, given where we are with COVID and given the journey we've been on, how do you think we should manage that sort of uh, balance between the individual's toler tolerability of risk and the need for society to set a level of risk that is tolerable to society. And do you think we're there for COVID now? Okay, I'll answer the second part of the question first, because I think it's no. But I think, you know, where, where we are now compared to where we were 15 months ago is very different. That, I mean, Andrew, what, what you're basically asking me to do, I think, is to, um, is to resurface the whole tolerability of risk argument for nuclear power stations, because we have been here before. You know, when the, when the R2P2 document was published, that was in, as a direct consequence of the nuclear power debate that was happening exactly at the time. You know, Sizewell B was being built and there was a question about, OK, um, if I get in my car and drive to the beach, um, how, how happy am I to undergo that risk versus living three miles away from Sizewell and being enveloped in a cloud of radioactive material? Um, and do, because the question really, I think, is, do individuals and society have different tolerability levels for risk? And of course we do. You know, I will choose to do things in my spare time, which I wouldn't expect others to do, and vice versa. And there will be situations where, I mean, it's a good example at the minute, isn't there, with all the, all the decisions around who's getting the vaccine, in what order. There was an interesting question I heard earlier um, last week, I think it was on the Indie Sage briefing, where somebody asked a brilliant question and they said, if you get through vaccinating all of the vulnerable groups in the UK, why would you carry on vaccinating young people when you could donate that vaccine to other countries who haven't got through the first nine groups? And that's exactly the kind of question. And it, look, it's never going to be easy. So, it sh and, and as I said right at the start, you know, regulators should get a tough time. But equally, if the question is, is, is so hard, it can't be answered. Regulators have to say, that, that is just a really difficult, wicked societal problem. And the best we can do is come up with, with, a, with a different compromise. But I think the, you know, the idea that you would ever get to a situation, I, I was very, I was very, um, I was in two minds as to whether actually to put up the slide about the COVID risk levels. Because those, you know, whether it's the five, four, three, two, one, I think the COVID risk level went five serious to one not serious because they wanted to give themselves the option for six and seven. But if you think, you know, a food or a restaurant, a food factory or a restaurant, number five, is, is as good as it gets, and they, they don't need to go beyond that. Um, but as, as, a, as a get out of jail book, and it'll be referenced in the, in the notes that will come out after this, because he talks about you know, self-awareness, curiosity, being, super, not, being, being, being careful about what numbers make you feel. Um, and I would also recommend anything that David Spiegelhalter writes and says, and again, those are referenced in the, in the notes, um, because a lot of this having has to come from individuals. And, you know, it's interesting, one of the, um, so I'm sorry to keep blanging on about the references, but there's been a recent, you know, satirical book come out with the, with the, with the provocative title, um, you know, stop, stop telling me what to do kind of thing. And, you know, those, those, there are a lot of people pushing back against this. There are a lot of people saying, keep your nose out of my daily business. Mind your own bloody business. I, I, if I want to go to the shops without a face mask, I'll do it. Well, we're about to recalibrate all of that, aren't we? So I just think it's going to be difficult. But that, that would be a good argument, I think, for having a look to see if R2P2 is still fit for purpose, because it was cast against the expectations of, of nuclear risk. I think COVID is a legitimate sort of update to that. And an awful lot has happened in the meantime, and it'd be well worth looking at. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Neil. Uh, uh, David, sorry, I'm passing on to Neil now. <laughs> all right. Yes, thank you so much, David, for all you've done. Uh, as you. we come to the, the, the final moments 
I don't know whether you want to reflect at all on uh, your experience in the last hour and a half. Um, uh, otherwise, um, do you have you any further? I think I think I'll comments? I think I'll quit while I'm ahead, Neil. I think I'll leave it at that. I'll quit while I'm ahead. All right, that's brilliant. So. Uh, on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for what's been a really fantastic lecture. Um, so many from the university uh, and from HSC and from, uh, we're, we're really impressed to see a wider community, an, an international community that has been uh, tuned in to you today. Um, and uh, just again, can I pass on all our thanks for, uh, for your insights and uh, we look forward to the next Ashton Lecture. Um, which we'll be publicising around the community for next academic year. So, Thanks, thank Neil. you and goodbye.